All right, good evening and welcome to an evening of STP. For those who are unaware, for the past decade or so, we've released seniors for the last three weeks of their senior year to go out into the community to do job shadow or community service. It's called the Senior Transition Project because it is a transition from their high school years to their post-grad years. And for some, it's a glimpse into the future. It gives them a chance to see what they will be doing eventually in their careers. We had uh, 138 senior transition projects over the last few days. And we've selected these that you're going to see here tonight just to give you a sample of what we saw. So we're going to start off with Griffin Carpenter. Griffin, if you'll come on down. Okay, um, so for my project, I, uh, I went to Manhattan's East Village and worked uh, with Show of Force Productions. Um, it's a production company that produces films, uh, public television, and uh, it does social media work for other uh, production companies' uh, films. <clears throat> so uh, next year, I'm going to be attending NYU uh, for acting. Uh, and NYU is really <clears throat> primarily known, at least the Tisch School of the Arts is primarily known for its um, uh, film school. Um, so a lot of the actors in the acting program build, build up their uh, resumes and their reels by doing uh, work with the film students and by doing the NYU student films. Uh, and I thought this working with a production company might give me an edge. Um, so, uh, and might help me make some connections with some possibly uh, the future maybe of, of American film industry. Um, and I really didn't know anything going into this. I've only done stage acting before, uh, so I wasn't really an asset to the company. Um, so while I was there, Show Force was working uh, really just on two major product projects. The first one was uh, Half the Sky. Um, and Half the Sky is a movement that was started, um, I don't know how many years ago, by some uh, recently by some uh, New York Times col columnists, uh, husband and wife pair, who uh, wrote a book uh, to raise awareness about uh, fee women's oppression in um, third world countries. Um, and they're trying to stop that through education and financial empowerment, but mainly trying to w raise awareness of it. And so they've gotten this Facebook game going, and they wrote a book, and they finally contacted Maro Chermayev and uh, Jeff Dupre, who are the directors at uh, Show of Force. and. Uh, they made this film with them, uh, and they've won <clears throat> numerous awards for it uh, now. And so what they're working on now is Half the Sky, uh, the second installment, which is going to be uh, in the Latin, Latin America, Latin American countries. Before they did Sierra Leone, India, Vietnam, a lot of countries to our east, and now they're going uh, to stay in the Americas. And um, so, uh, and then the next project that uh, was going on was not, this is not, uh, it was Constitution USA, which is a show hosted on PBS. It was like a four part mini series uh, hosted by uh, Peter Sagal. Uh, and it was not made by uh, Show of Force, but they were hired to take care of its marketing through social media. So uh, I primarily did social media work and production assistance. Uh, with the social media, with Constitution USA, they would have me watch the episode, and then uh, divide, I, I pick maybe five or six major topics um, that the episode covered. Um, and then for each topic, I would uh, find 50 or 60 organizations online that uh, might be interested in the show because, of, because it mentions that topic. And then we wrote out in email templates. Uh, the interns wrote out email templates, and we would send them out to, at the end for each episode, it turned out to be like 250, 300 organizations, and we'd ask them, uh, please tell your follower, if, if you're interested, please tell your followers about this, or tweet about it at like, hashtag ConstitutionPBS, et cetera. 
Um, and then I also worked on uh, developing, they would, uh, Show of Force would send PBS live tweets to tweet from their Twitter account um, during the airing of the episodes. So the interns uh, at Show of Force would develop like what, uh, what would be said at what time during the episode. And uh, right there on the uh, right is um, a pictogram we made. That's uh, an intern who's working there all year. His name's Eddie. And it says, like, do you know how much of your information is available on the internet? It was an episode about privacy. So uh, we've got a really good graphics team, as you can see. It was really interesting. Um, and then with Half the Sky, the social media that I did there, uh, I, I was uh, put just uh, to respond um, to, Twitter, to Twitter, like, favorites and retweets and stuff. All I had to say was thank you. So um, it was, they could trust me with that, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, so that's, and then production assistance, it was only on half the sky because that was the only company, or that was the only uh, production that they were working on at the time. And so what I would do, I would, uh, first I would go on runs and I would buy uh, like ink cartridges at like Staples and then uh, like batteries for cameras and stuff. I would also, um, I would, t I took care of packing because right now they're in uh, Columbia on a scout. Um, for Half the Sky Part 2, and um, they, I helped prepare for that, so I had to make sure that all the bags were under 50 pounds and all the day packs with all the cliff bars were evened out. Um, and then I was taught how to make extension cords. I made like 10 or 15 extension cords um, uh, that they're currently using on the uh, Columbia Scout. And then uh, I also during my last few days, they let me design a uh, press pass that they would use for the actual shoot. Um, so they uh, so they asked me if I knew Adobe Photoshop, and I said yes. And this is what I gave them. And then um, uh, they said, "Okay, this is great. Can you uh, can you fill in um, all the crew members' names? Can you make an individual press pass? Here's a for for each pe person on the crew. Here's a spreadsheet with all their names and titles and numbers." So I, uh, I made the directors and I made the producers and, and the cameramen and then I came to the celebrity advocate and um, Half the Sky uh, is kind of, they use celebrity advocates in the film um, to kind of carry the narrative and make it more accessible, I guess, for uh, viewers. Uh, and this time the, uh, the celebrity advocate was Eva Longoria and I, so I, I made, I wrote her name out and I wrote her title and I got a picture that I figured she'd be happy with and then uh, and then I went to the spreadsheet and there was no number so I, uh, I sent an email and I said uh, almost done could you just send me Eva Longoria's phone number uh, <laughs> and I got an email back and they were like uh, in your dreams <laughs> uh, so I guess uh, it did not necessarily meet my ref uh, expectations, this internship, uh, in that I, I, researched, um, I researched production assistance, and that's what I came prepared for, and that's what I was looking forward to. And from basically day one, most of my day was taken up in front of the laptop, working on marketing, so like with social media stuff. Um, and uh, doing the production assistance was decidedly more fun than doing any of the marketing. But I will say that uh, I bet the skills that I got from uh, learning how to write innocuous tweets um, that don't really hurt a company but can say thank you um, to another, uh, another organization, uh, they're probably more useful in the, uh, professional, the general professional world than anything I would have gained by doing straight production assistance. Um, as far as challenges go, uh, lack of experience, I didn't... Uh, know anything like I said so uh, learning how to make extension cords learning how to make sure someone sees a tweet that you post but someone else doesn't um, that probably took my first two or three days just getting uh, acclimated to, to everything I needed to to do and then uh, also just concentration for probably seven out of the eight hours every day I was in front of my laptop responding to one or two tweets an hour so I need I didn't want to sign into my own Twitter account and start fooling around on there, so I tried to, um, I tried to read articles about uh, the Half the Sky movement to be able to make more educated tweets, I guess. Um, but that was tough, uh, because that's seven hours of that. 
Um, and then what I gain, handiness. Uh, I can make extension cores now, and I'm pretty good at writing uh, just uh, stuff that... Uh, f I, 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 if a company hired me for social media, I wouldn't need to know much about the company. I could write a, a tweet or an email that would help them. Um, and then finally, there's no such thing as an auteur. Um, in that, I, going into this, I kind of thought that a director, uh, when you see a movie, you're really seeing the product of a director, but that's not true at all. I think there are a lot of parts um, that go into filmmaking, especially documentary filmmaking, that have nothing to do with the director, and they never see any part of it, even after the film is distributed on DVD. And I thought that was really cool. Um, so that's, uh, thank you for listening. All right, so um, my STP was very broad, and I did a lot of different things, but sort of a broad way of explaining it is saying that my STP was to do theater in Toronto. So you can note the RE, the Canadian spelling of theater. So for some background about my STP, I was born in Toronto and lived there for six years. And when I lived there, my neighbors were Sandra Belkovsky and Greg Morrison. And Greg Morrison is a Tony Award winning composer. He composed The Drowsy Chaperone, as you can see up there, and that's what he got his Tony for. It's been produced all over the world, and it's been on Broadway. And Sandra Balkowski is also involved in theater. She's a dramaturg which means she, she does research for a show, figures out what the time era of the play is, figures out what accents will be needed, that sort of thing. Um, and so we've kept in touch with them, and over the years here in the US, I've sort of developed an interest in theater by being involved in theater at the high school, being in shows, working tech on shows, writing shows. And so I thought that doing an STP in theater would be an interesting way of seeing how it's done professionally. So we emailed Sandra, and she was amazing. She set up a schedule for me where I worked with various Toronto artists. Currently, she's working on a number of shows. One of the things she's doing is dramaturging for a Mel Brooks production. So initially going into this, I thought I'd be helping her out, stapling scripts for her for this Mel Brooks production. But what I did, I think, is so much cooler because I got to do a broad range of things. For example, uh, she sent me a, a draft of Canadian playwright Dan Radican's new musical, It's Always You. So I read through this musical, a uh, draft of it, I thought it was really cool. Then I got to attend a read-through of it at Sandra's house with Dan Radican, um, his daughter, Maddie Radican, Sheila McCarthy, who is a famous Canadian actress. She's been in the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Canada. She's been in a number of films. Um, and Sean Thompson, another noted Canadian actor. Which was, so I got to see these people reading through a script um, and singing songs from this, from this show, which was amazing. And it's still, it's going to be produced at the Fringe Festival in Toronto, which is a theater festival for shows that are either new, like this one, sort of unknown, um, or have been produced in the past, but aren't big main shows. And so I got to see this read through where it's not quite a rehearsal yet because the lines aren't memorized, but it's, you know, we have the actors are all picked out for the parts, so it's not an audition. And so after the read-through, I got to observe a discussion between the actors and Dan Radican about what questions they had about the script, how they wanted to interpret lines, which was so, so cool. And I even got to make a few comments myself, because I had received an earlier copy of the script 
and I noticed some changes. So most of my contributions were compliments saying, I think this change is really good, really adds to it, um, but I still got to contribute nonetheless. Uh, the next day, I worked with Chris Earle and Sherry Hallett. Um, Chris Earle and Sherry Hallett have their own production company called the Night Kitchen Theater. And he, Chris Earle is a Canadian playwright, and he produces shows with this production company with his wife, Sherry Hallett, and one of them is Radio 30. It's also being done at the Toronto Fringe Festival, but it's been done before, so they needed to write a press release for this revival of it, and I got to write the first draft of this press release for them, which was so, so cool because I got to not only see what you need to write a press release for the Toronto Fringe Festival, but I also got to see reviews for Radio 30 and pick out quotes that both intrigued you into wanting to see what the show is and also gave hints as to what it's about. So that was really cool, and then that night I also I watched, I saw the War of 1812 at the Video Cabaret Theater. And the War of 1812 was a show unlike any I'd really seen before for a number of reasons. The War of 1812 is um, a it's a comedy by Michael Hollingsworth, a Canadian playwright, and he's written a number of shows like these that are about a certain era in Canadian history. And so he has a whole series of them from before the, there were settlers in Canada up until um, in the early 70s, I believe. And I only saw this show, but it was really funny because he satirizes history. He spoofs the eras that he's displaying in his shows, which was so, so cool to see, especially in the War of 1812, where everyone was wearing white makeup on their faces and there were lavish costumes. And it was both funny and informative to watch. Um, the next day, I attended another show uh, by Sandra and Greg's friend, Dr. Cynthia Ashperger, who runs the acting program at Ryerson University. And so I saw this show at Ryerson University. It's not, it wasn't full, a full production just yet, but it was a staged reading of her show. Um, it's a new show by her. So like Dan Radican's show, it's still in development. It's just hers is at a more developed stage because uh, it was being produced in front of people and it was being performed. And so I was very impressed with how um, the actors hadn't had it, had the script for very long, but they were still able to perform it in front of an audience. And because it, they were professional actors, I was very impressed. But the next day, I was working with um, Greg again, and I helped him build this desk that you see to help him compose. So it has a pull-out keyboard that he can compose on, which is really cool. And we were talking about this show, and I realized that although I was very impressed with the acting and how quickly everyone, it, the actors, had seemed to pick up the script, um, the story itself wasn't very easy to follow, and there were flaws with it. And it was weird and really cool to see that I could look at, like, basically a professional production and look at the story underneath it. and be able to talk about it, and so, like, I saw the blinders were off, I guess, and I sort of saw the show for what it was, and I was able to critique it along with Greg, which was really, really cool. And then I got, I don't know if you can really see it very well, but I got to sign my name next to his, which is so, so cool to have my signature next to Greg Morrison's. Um, and then the next week, I worked with Linda Griffiths, another Canadian playwright actress. And so she's written a number of shows. Uh, she's starred in some of her shows. She's starred in other productions. But for her, I looked at um, The Duchess, which she wrote. And she has two versions, one um, that she, like her original copy, and another the production copy, so there were changes made for it to be produced on stage. Lines were changed, monologues were shorter, entrances and exits were changed to make it easier for actors. And so I just went through these two different scripts and highlighted the changes in the scripts. And that was cool because I got to see sort of, even if you have a script that is really beautiful in its language and 
seems like it would be really great on stage, you do have to make some changes to make sure you can produce it, make it practical in reality. And so that was, the, that was what I did on the first day with her. On the second day, uh, she went to the Paz Mirai Theater, which is famous in theater circles for being sort of a stepping stone for young actors and young playwrights because it's where new shows and where young actors sort of have their start. And so she went to this Paz Mirai Theater because uh, her show, Heaven Above, Heaven Below, another show by her, is being produced there. And so she went and talked to everyone who was working on her show and told them about her beginnings in acting and playwriting and her beginnings at this Paz Mirai Theater. So that was really cool to hear about all the work she'd done and how long it had taken her to get to this point. And so the next day, I worked with Colin Mockery from Whose Line Is It Anyway? If you've ever seen that show, which is so, so cool. And his wife, Deb McGrath, who's also been on TV. And uh, I didn't do too much theater related with them, but I actually got uh, to be at their house and sort of help them organize their house for this big party they were having. Um, nothing theater related there either, but still really, really cool to talk to them and uh, ask them about sort of where they went to school and what their favorite like theater productions are and that sort of thing, which is so, so fun and so cool. And then after that, I worked with actress Nikki Guadani, who's a friend of Linda Griffith's. And she was taking a book of poetry titled Hooked and turning it into a one-hour production that could be done at the Edinburgh Festival. And um, she had done this book of poetry as seven monologues before, all herself. She'd actually performed it at herself and would invite 12 people to her home to watch her do these seven monologues in seven, seven different rooms. And it was sort of a a feat that took about three hours and she wanted to shave it down to one hour to be able to uh, have it done at the Edinburgh Festival. So I helped her th with that and I got to see how you can take a book of poetry that's obviously really beautiful and well-crafted language and shave it down to one hour and still retain the same themes, the same meaning. And so, final lessons that I learned from everything I did. Theater can be done in many different ways in many different places. Um, so like the historical plays, the War of 1812, the way you can present history in such a cool way, satirizing it, making fun of it, and at the same time informing your audience about a certain time is so, so cool. And um, the Pazmere Eye Theater, which I showed you, you can do it, you can do a show in a traditional theater or like Nikki Guadani did it, do it in a home uh, and invite only a small group of people. Theater, there's so many different ways to do it and, um, and so many different places you can do it in. Uh, communication and honesty are important. Um, being able to, making, all right, how I, what I learned also from this was talking to these amazing theater icons. I mean, it's so easy to be intimidated, intimidated by them, so easy to not know what to say. But what I found was just trying to be myself and sort of talking like I would to a normal person, trying to be honest in my questions, made it easier for them to respond honestly, honestly, or at least it seemed honest to me, right? So being able to communicate with people and being honest were important. And finally, you can choose what role theater will play in your life. So what I also learned is theater can be in your life in a number of ways. You can be a playwright, you can be an actor, you can be both, you can be a director. There are a number of different ways where theater can be in your life. Or you can just decide to attend theater and not be involved in the production of it. Anyway, you're still keeping it in your life. So that was what I learned.
so for my SDP, I worked at the Maine Irish Heritage Center, and I was there for both weeks, and um, my advisor was Michael Connell, and he's a professor at USM as well as the curator for the museum there. And I was there also with another student from Cape, uh, her name was Sydney Donovan, and um, we were able to do a lot while we were there for those two weeks, but before I get into specifically what we did, I just wanted to go a little bit into the history because I feel like that's really important to understanding uh, the uh, center's significance in the community. Um, before it was a heritage center, um, the main Irish Heritage Center was actually St. Dominic's Church. It was a Catholic church that was built in the late 1800s. And um, a lot of people forget that the Irish were kind of one of the first waves of immigrants to the U.S. And they faced a lot of discrimination and there was a lot that they had to overcome. So St. Dominic sort of acted like a, a haven for them um, to protect their culture and not um, be discriminated against. So those that were coming off of the boats and were um, in poverty and needed help could go and get clothes and food and um, it kind of transcended its position as a religious place and became sort of a place to protect the Irish heritage and culture. Um, so there's a lot of history in St. Dominic's um, that needed to be protected. So in 1997 when the Catholic Diocese decided to close the church there was a lot of unhappiness um, initially because a lot of people really wanted to protect that legacy. Um, initially the city of Portland wanted to um, bulldoze the place and not protect um, the church as a whole, but in 2002 it officially became the main Irish Heritage Center, so it's a protected landmark and um, it's able to persist. Um, right now there's a genealogy center in there, a library, a museum, and it also hosts um, community events. So it's kind of retained its status as a place for um, the Irish to come and celebrate their culture and um, a place in the community for people to gather. Um, so why I chose this STP, I've been volunteering at the Maine Irish Heritage Center on and off for the past three years, um, but I mostly helped out with like events, so if there was a mailing or anything like that, I could help hand out name tags or stuff envelopes, but I never really got to work specifically in the museum as much. Um, so this STP offered um, the opportunity to work directly with artifacts and to help out with that, which I was really interested in. Um, it also offered the ability to work with some cutting edge technology and help out a little bit with the technical aspect of the center, which I thought would be really interesting because I do have an interest in computers in college. Um, so I thought that that would be a really good opportunity to combine two things that I really like, the modern and the historic. So I thought it would be a good fit for me. Um, and so uh, one of the major projects that we had was uh, digitizing a lot of documents. Um, one of the big things that we digitized was two collections of newspapers. One of them was from 1887 and that was the Portland Advertiser. And what that was was a basically a human interest newspaper. So it was a lot of local community events, um, a lot focused in Portland. And um, that was really amazing. And the other one was a 1904 newspaper called the um, Main State Press. And that one was incredible because that was more um, kind of the traditional newspaper. So it was international affairs. It um, documented the beginning of the Russo-Japanese War. It had Roosevelt's re-election in there, the up-and-comer Taft, who would later become president. It had things about the um, independence and suffrage and civil rights, but just the beginning of those issues. So it was all just sort of uh, coming into the popular dialogue in these articles and we were directly handling them and taking information from them and um, documenting them which I thought was absolutely incredible. Um, we also got to uh, scan photos and ephemera for the Montgomery Guard collection that was at the center and um, the Montgomery Guards was basically the precursor for the National Guard. Um, they were basically uh, sons of Civil War veterans who had a lot of patriotism but nowhere to put it really. So they would join the, uh, the Montgomery Guards and then they could do kind of the honorific stuff so they would host events and they would um, do drills and balls and stuff like that. So um, we had a collection of young Irishmen who were in the Montgomery Guard and we had um, ephemera is basically the blanket term for uh, miscellaneous uh, museum stuff. So tickets, um, papers, uh, promotion um, artifacts, stuff like that. All of that was things that we helped digitize and um, scan up onto the computer, which leads me to my next thing. Oh, and this is just a better uh, view of kind of our station. 
Um, when a piece of paper is too fragile to scan for whether it's the light or it's just too big, um, we used a high quality camera to capture some of those. Um, so the one on the bottom is a promotion paper for Edward E. Philbrook, who was a Montgomery Guardsman. Um, and then the bigger picture is, I thought it was really cool, it's um, a, the, a group of women telling the House Committee that they believe they should have the right to vote. And I thought this was really cool because it was pushed to the side in the newspaper. It wasn't the main headline at all. Um, but it was amazing to read. And um, the way the newspaper is set up is that it kind of has topics in columns. So in that column was other um, articles about women in general. So there was one about do women make good teachers, um, things about fashion ver versus like your status in the community and things like that. So it was really cool to see the beginning of the dialogue for why women should vote and sort of seeing that while it's in, you know, even though it had a long way to go at that point, it was still um, being discussed and we were there directly handling it, which I thought was amazing. Um, and so the other big project that we had while we were at the center was we helped to launch the virtual museum. Um, and I, this was the project that I was most excited about because um, last year um, in 2012 the center had got a donation so that they could get Pass Perfect. And Pass Perfect is kind of the gold standard for museum software. It's what any big museum would use something like Pass Perfect or Pass Perfect itself. But it was really incredible for the center to have gotten it. And so um, what we were able to do in those two weeks was all of the stuff that I had just talked about us um, taking pictures of. We also were able to conduct interviews and um, do some research on our own at like the Portland um, room in the Portland Public Library and places like that. And then we compiled all of the data that we got on those artifacts and we were able to um, feed it through the Past Perfect system, archive all of it, and then um, we were eventually able to um, run some of the HTML code so that we were able to make an addition to the Main Irish Heritage Center's website. So if you had any interest, you could actually go to mainirish.com slash pastperfect and you would see everything that me and Sydney did for those two weeks. Um, everything was entered by us. Uh, we took the pictures and we helped format. We picked the green color. Um, so uh, it was all uh, what we did for those two weeks and it's kind of like a tangible um, proof that we were there and um, this was really cool because we kind of chewed through some of the data and coding and stuff like that and so now it's really open to be expanded upon so they're interested in getting more multimedia things in there so things like oral histories, podcasts, things like that could all be run through this system now and we kind of just uh, ran through the boring stuff and got it out of the way. So now it's kind of the foundation is set for it to be run much more smoothly. And so we were really excited to have been there for those two weeks to help out. And it's just kind of representative of how uh, museum and genealogy, how those um, institutions are changing because of technology. And so what I learned, I learned how to use Past Perfect, which is a really good thing because if I ever wanted to work in a museum, I, didn't, I don't need to be trained in Past Perfect at all. I know how it runs and I know how to use it. Um, so I thought that was pretty good. Um, I also learned a lot about organization and how um, archiving things like this really requires a lot of keeping things straight and having them when you're running through thousands of images at once, you have to keep everything in folders so that nothing gets, you know, is missed or anything because it really has the potential to ruin things and there was a big scare for two days where we weren't sure how the um, website was going to upload with the extended thing so we were worried we were going to crash it but we didn't we saved it it's nice and clean now so it was nice to know that our organizational skills were good enough to upload it and not ruin everything. Um, and I also learned a lot about Portland history. Um, one of the amazing things about the Main Irish Heritage Center is that everyone is incredibly passionate who works there. They all know so much and want to share it with everyone. So um, every 10 minutes, Sydney or I was being pulled aside by a genealogist and being told a little bit about something that was found or Mike was taking us on a walking tour of Portland and we were learning about architecture or anything. So I learned so much about the city that I grew up in and it was really incredible to spend two weeks with people who just loved what they did. 
And I also learned a lot about genealogy and how much technology kind of plays into that now and how things like Ancestry.com and online databases have completely changed an institution. And um, it's just really amazing to see how much something can change with technology. And it was such an amazing experience to have been a part of. And those are my sources. So as you can see, what all of these presenters have in common is their passion. We've heard uh, from theater and television production and history, and now we're going to change gears. Get it? <laughs> and we're going to go now to um, Maddie Gears and her passion, which was she worked with a large animal vet. So Maddie, come on down. I got a real future in comedy. Oh, no, you <laughs> well, um, I did my SDP with Bo Vet Services uh, with Pete Caradonna. He's a large animal vet in um, Mid Coast, Maine. So my future goals right now: I live on a small dairy replacement heifer farm in King Elizabeth, and I raise calves and I buy them at auction, raise them, breed them, and then sell them to dairy farmers for them to have their calf and produce milk. So that's where I got my idea for large animal vet. Um, and that's my life goal, I guess, and to specialize in dairy. And so large animal vets, they do more livestock, um, so cows, pigs, horses, um, the things that you can make a profit on. So Pete is a country vet, like, and he, we went to all of those places, so he traveled all around um, mid-coast Maine. We went at least, it was at least a half hour to 45 minutes from each farm call. So our daily life <laughs> starts, our day starts off at 7.30, and it's not a this is not a clean job, <laughs> so as you can tell. Um, he's, that's, um, so our day started around 7.30 and would end around 4. Um, our basic things that we did um, on an everyday basis was deworming, which is taking the, um, helping cows clean the parasites out of, like internal parasites. Vaccines, like your rabies vaccine, like your dogs and cats get. Um, pregnancy checks is what he's doing right now for, um, to see if your cow's pregnant and also to see if they're in heat because in doing livestock, especially cows, you induce their heat so that you can know when you're going to have, um, when they're going to start milking. Um, so I, I helped with the cast removal. That was pretty cool. Uh, castrations, surgery. We did a teat surgery and a displaced abomasum, which I'll explain later. An umbilical hernia, um, which is basically when you cut the umbilical cord and it gets infected and you have to do surgery on that. So country vets, they work out of their truck. Um, every thing, that's a cast, not a leg, but <laughs> everything in that truck that you, he uses, it's amazing. I mean, he, he has everything in there from surgery to um, if a farmer needs something that they can only buy off of a vet, he has in there. Uh, he just, it's like crazy in there. You open it and it kind of explodes, but um, <laughs> he lives out of it and that's his, that's his office. So, my job. I observed a lot. <laughs> um, it's a tough job. We work mostly with cows, so I helped wrangle them <laughs> a lot. I mean, I'm used to that because I have cows, but um, like that cast that came off of a calf that we had to, like three people sit on to get cut off. Um, and also organic farms, they don't use any um, antibiotics or vaccines or use anything. So I helped um, use an iodine solution, which is like okay for the regulations for an organic farm and I helped um, use that. So I'll walk you through the most exciting part of my SDP, and that was a displaced albumasum surgery. Uh, that is where, when a cow has a calf, there's a bunch of room in there, and so sometimes their organs can get mixed around, and an albumasum is um, a part of their stomach. They have four compartments, and the albumasum is part of it, so sometimes it can swing around all their organs and get in the wrong spot. So I kind of explain it through my slides. Um, he, there's like a seven you can see, and he, that's where he cleans it uh, for surgery. And everything's sterile. I got to get scrubbed in and everything and hand him stuff. Um, and you clean it with iodine and to disinfect. 
So our patient is top right. <laughs> she, she is awake the whole time, which is pretty cool. They do a nerve block on the seven on her stomach. So she, she's awake and fine. She just can't feel anything. So I thought that was pretty cool. So that is the abomasum bottom right. And you cut through three layers of muscles and then you follow the omentum to the abomasum and deflate it using an air compressor actually. And then you pull the abomasum back and you sew it into the lining of her stomach and then you disinfect. So that was absolutely the best part of my STP. I got to help with that, and I got to learn kind of how to do a Whipple stitch. I probably couldn't do it now, but <laughs> it, was, it was awesome, and it was a great taste at what maybe I can possibly do someday. So I learned that being a large animal vet is part of bettering the farming community. Many farmers depend on him. He got injured, actually, um, a week before I was going to be there, and he was off a day, like his injury is a day. And he had to push back about 10 other um, calls, and it really, it messes, I mean, it messed everybody up. And they were like, are you okay? You know, they were really concerned. But it's just amazing how much they depend on him, and they um, work their schedule around, because he do not only treats them, but he also like, helps them set up their time for when they're going to come into heat, when they're going to calve, and that's basically when they're going to get their production and be able to follow the cycle. Mm -hmm. So that was very, really important. And I helped with um, raw, I, helping a farm get their raw organic milk license. So that means that like, if you go to a farmer's market and it's raw milk, that's not pasteurized or treated at all. That's straight from the cow. And um, so you have to get a tuberculosis test, and I helped administer those and then check a week later to make sure there was no reaction, which if there was, it'd be in the news. It's a big deal. It's kind of a formality, but we had to do it. So that was pretty cool. So what I learned is I absolutely want to become a large animal vet. <laughs> that is something that um, I'm passionate about. And I learned that the satisfaction of helping farmers is actually a huge part of the job. I mean, treating the animals, like for dairy, because I do want to specialize in dairy, so treating the animals and then seeing the farmer and knowing that their, what they produce is going to come directly to your table is really important. Um, no matter if it's milk, cheese, yogurt, ice cream, whatever. And the fact that that's their livelihood is also awesome. To know that you're helping them with um, their life and what they depend on. Um, and so, and then I definitely, I was going back and forth, I do have horses, so I was going back and forth. You can only kind of do one of the other cows or horses when you do become a large animal vet. And this helped me decide that I do want to specialize in dairy. So my challenges, um, the business mentality of it all was difficult because if you're at a 300 cow dairy farm and you're checking the cows, and we had one that had tumors in her uterus and we had to decide, you know, she's probably not going to get pregnant and not going to produce for you. So that means you'd have to ship her. And it's hard because being in Maine, it's a small community, it's a, or a small state, so you, every community and their cows, it just, they mean a lot to them. So that was a hard thing to, for him to be like, you know, I don't think that, like, this one would cost more to keep than to produce. So that was definitely hard because you see the farmers like, oh, you know, it's, it was difficult. And the while you're here, Doc, <laughs> that's, uh, like, we'll get somewhere and we'll be like, okay, we're going to be here for a half hour because we're just going to, you know, vaccinate these calves and then be on our way. And then we get there and the farmer's like, well, I have this cow, I need to get castrated, and could you vaccinate this one? And, you know, like all these different things. So then it pushes the whole day back and that's difficult. And I can see Pete would get frustrated. <laughs> I can totally see where that comes from. But, um, yeah, so that is my presentation. Thank you, Maddie. Next, I'd like to invite up uh, Tally Perkins. Uh, SDP, I worked at Octagon, which everyone asks, well, what's Octagon? Um, so I'll get into that, but I specifically worked at the Olympics and Action Sports Division. So Octagon is a worldwide company. They 
deal with athletes, with personalities, just lifestyles, putting on events and everything. They have a thousand plus employees that work in 68 offices all over the world that span 22 countries and six uh, continents. So the Olympic and Action Sports Division focuses mainly on just those. Uh, Olympic athletes and action sports athletes like BMX bikers, skiers, uh, surfers, skateboarders, those kind of things. Um, and while I was there, I learned a, a lot about everything that they did. And one of the big facts that I learned that I thought was really shocking is they've represented at least one gold medal athlete in all of the Olympic Games, summer and winter, since 1984. Um, which is kind of a big deal, I guess, because they, it's an international company, so it's a lot of, it wasn't just U.S. Mm -hmm. athletes, it was Australia and things like that. Um, at Octagon, when I was there, they told me they work with contract negotiation, with commercial opportunities like social media and sponsors and getting your name out there. And they also do career management. So if you just want to know kind of what to do with your money when you actually get it for those athletes, they worked with that. And that's a picture of the actual office, which when I first walked in, I thought was really, really cool. Um, so this is on the, l the left. It's a picture of their roster, and you can see they have a ton of athletes, and there was no way I was going to familiarize myself with all of those. Um, but these are a few that I really did familiarize myself with. Um, top is Maynard Seth Westcott, who is the only gold medalist in snowboard cross snowboarding. Um, and then there's Apollo Ono, who's a speed skater, Kelly Clark, who's a snowboarder, and of course Michael Phelps, which everyone really knows. So this was my office. I had a nice little cubicle set in the corner to stay out of everyone's way, which was kind of lonely, but I'd listen to music and things like that to keep myself busy when I was in between projects. So my motivation. I've been an athlete all my life, and I'm lucky enough that I get to play four more years in college, which after that, it kind of dies off because I'm playing lacrosse, and there's no professional women's lacrosse, like there's football and baseball and things like that. So I knew that I couldn't, my athletic career and athletics couldn't just stop there. Like, I know I wanted to pursue a career in that. And Octagon had so many different options. It, they have events, PR, marketing, you can be an agent, everything. And they have locations all over the world. Um, some of the challenges, like I said, was familiarizing myself with the athletes because they have so many and they're all from other countries and things like that. So I, the ones that I worked with, I familiarize myself with more, and some I still don't even know. I couldn't put a name to the face, um, or a face to the name. So another hard thing was product brainstorming, which was coming up with ideas for clients, because I didn't know the clients. I don't know if they're goofy, if they're really strict, if they're kind of just go with the flow, or if they really like things done a certain way. So that was one of the harder things. And writing the bios, which I'll talk about the product brainstorming and writing the bios later, but it was very particular. They have a certain amount of creativity you can use and a certain way that they like everything, so that was definitely difficult. So my duties, like I said, I wrote bios for clients. Um, I worked with incentives and endorsements for athletes and the product brainstorming and research. So the bios, these were four bios that I actually personally made and they are going to use, which is something that I thought was really cool. Um, the first one I made took eight revisions, and by the last one, it only took two. And so on each of these, they have pictures, their name, their sport, or whatever. And then they have personal info, which is like height, weight, where they live, and then like a fun fact. And then they also have career highlights, their sponsors, social media, and stuff like that. But then the rest of it was kind of up to who the athlete was and who was making the bio. And some of them had more family affair stuff, like their family was into the sports, so that's how they got into it. Some of it was just they picked up a skateboard one day and loved it. Um, so it was definitely, I think it's really cool that they're going to use these to pitch their athletes to everyone and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I worked with incentives and endorsements, which I found a little shocking because they, athletes, of course, they have a contract. They've signed with Octagon, but then they also sign with their sponsors. So for instance, Kelly Clark, who is the snowboarder, is a, has a sponsor of Burton. So Burton has their own contract for Kelly, and she'll get, um, for instance, for a half-page spread or a picture or whatever, she gets a certain amount of money, and then if she has the Burton logo in that, then she gets even more money. 
So it was a lot of flipping through magazines, looking back at the roster, finding things, and writing it down, and then sending it to my advisor, and then he'd send it back. And one of those challenges was just not getting bored flipping through and catching yourself not actually looking at the roster. Um, and it was also hard because some of the magazines or newspapers or whatever were online, but they weren't the full version, so you didn't know if they ended up being in that or whatever. But it was really cool to see really how an athlete makes their money. They don't just get paid like weekly or whatever. It's based on where you appear. So product research and brainstorming. Um, I did some for Allie Raisman, who was the Olympic gold medal gymnast. And she's just roughly, I think she's a year older than I am, but a lot of the people in the office are obviously older than I am. So they wanted someone who was her age to find products and all that stuff. So it was really cool to say, oh, I like this product. Like Maybe I'll see Allie's face on it next time or whatever. Um, and then I worked with, they had an idea to have a surf camp for Elena Blanchard, who is a surfer. And with that, I looked at the top surf beaches, where they were in the country, if they were family friendly, if they were more rough surf and all that stuff. And then I also looked at products for boys, girls, parents, and then specifically moms. And use, they may use those products to get sponsors to put on the actual surf camp. Um, and then I, the last one, the last things I did, which what I really started getting into and then we didn't have enough time, was product research and brainstorming for Dovelt Quince, who is a trainer on The Biggest Loser. And he's really into chivalry and old-fashioned and being a gentleman. And a lot of products nowadays, you can't really find that. They're all teen appeal and all that stuff. So it was really hard to find something that was conservative and appropriate for what he wanted. And it definitely took a lot more brain power to figure that out, but it was when we pitched it to the other woman who was our supervisor, she loved the ideas we came up with and it was really satisfying. And then these are some of the sponsors of um, athletes that they have, of course. You see Michael Phelps and Apollo on um, the Subway commercials, but they also have lots of other sponsors. So my summary, I loved my SDP. I wish I had two more weeks there or even could get an internship there. Um, which I think working there, I made a lot of connections and they were like, come back, like, get in touch with us after you're done with college or whatever, after your first year and maybe we'll get you an internship. And it was definitely, definitely something I can see myself going down the road, like Maddie said, and having this STP really like solidified that this is what I want to do. And I really, going in, I didn't know exactly what went into having an agency and all, being an athlete and being a manager and all that stuff. And by the end, I knew most of the ropes, but it was a lot of, I didn't know there were so many little things that went into an athlete's career. And it was just, all in all, it was just an awesome experience, and I wish I had more time. Thank you, Tally. So um, what I neglected to mention when I started off this evening is uh, the senior transition project is also known as field, field work because in the month or two prior to this, students are doing research in their English classes to try to learn a little bit more about it. Um, what you've heard from all the speakers tonight is their passion. For some of them, this is not just you know, a project to complete you know, before they graduate, but it's something that could be a step in the career that they're going to pursue. Um, so next up, I'd like to invite Max Barber to come on down. Oh. 
There we go. All right. Hi, my name is Max Larburn from ISTP. I worked at GBRIT PR, which is a public relations firm in South Portland, Maine. That was started in 1998. I worked under principals Jim and Jillian Britt, and uh, they have a wide array of clients focusing on arts, hospitality, entertainment, food, and nonprofit industries. So the reason I chose this SDP is because I'm very interested in event planning. I do it on the small scale for school with Superfan and other school organizations. And I felt like it would be really cool to learn how to do it on the big scale. And uh, also this industry embraces the entrepreneurship and creative spirit. And next year I'll be going to Babson College and studying uh, business and entrepreneurship and how they work together. And also I have, I have a big interest, interest with social media. And for all of these events that I had made, I use social media as my primary source of marketing for them. And which is why my, uh, my central question for this was how has the increase in social media changed the approach of these PR firms? And so the key thing with understanding what PR firms do is how and why they deliver the message. This message can be about a client, a service, a customer, uh, or anything like that. And they do so through really five key concepts, which is marketing, uh, researching, social media, media relations, and then event planning for uh, that client. And so luckily, I was able to experience each of these key concepts. Um, starting with research, the first three days, I is a strictly a desk job, and for the first three days, uh, I did research about school lunches. So the state of Maine had approached maybe five or six PR firms as to why there was uh, less of an involvement with school lunches, both high school and middle school, and what they should do to change, or how can Maine uh, not fall into this category of this decreasing number. And so, Jim approached me trying to get my response, and so I did three days of research on it, and I had to prepare my presentation for him, in which I used a phone call I called Mrs. Almendinger, one of our, uh, one of our cafeteria lunch ladies, as well as to take uh, menus from international and uh, local and compare them. And so I had to come up with recommendations, and that was, uh, that was really interesting. And then for food trucks, my brother owns a food truck, uh, mainly burgers, and I uh, Jim approached me asking to find numbers between other markets and how food trucks being legal in Portland will compare to others and whether or not they will cannibalize the local uh, restaurants or add to the food community. And then also I had to do story pitches for tourism for a specific client uh, called the Camden Harbor Inn in Camden, Maine, in which I had to do a story pitch for bike trails in Maine as well as the best spots for, uh, for fall foliage and for marketing. We created a press kit for David's Restaurant, including 388 and Opus 10, in which uh, I had to design a tri-fold brochure, as well as uh, get menus, uh, other information about these three restaurants, and put them into uh, kind of a press kit to give to maybe 10 of the most popular hotels in the Portland area, in order for them to pass the message on. It's like a concierge, for an example. Uh, social media was used for most of the research with the lunches. There's a lot of nutrition groups, Nutrition for Maine High Schools uh, and other pages like that, as well as the GBRIT page. They run a Maine Restaurant Week, and so they would ask questions that we would face, such as, why do you think there's a decrease in school lunches? And they would get paragraph responses from all these foodies, which was great because I got to use it. Um, media relations, which is kind of finding someone to use to promote your, or to promote an idea. and so. Uh, uh, I had to go through their database of writers, which is thousands of writers, and find one that pertains to heat market or home improvement and heating for Yodel, which creates uh, wood fire stoves. And then also during the whole time that I was there, the two weeks, they were trying to promote a new chef at the Camden Harbor Inn. And so that was great to be a part of because he's going to New York with all these press releases and all these famous people are trying to get involved. That way they can have this big uh, introduction for him. And for, food, uh, for event planning, it was my personal event, which was food trucks for fundraisers. And so I took everything that I learned and put it to the test and created Portland's food trucks for fundraiser, fundraisers proposal to, give to, to present to the city of Portland. And so under their guidance, I created uh, this presentation in which the idea was to create uh, an event in a locally uh, in Portland at the Eastern Prom with four or five of the most popular food trucks and donate a percentage of the revenue to, um, to American Red Cross Disaster Relief of Maine, particularly those affected by the Lewis and fires. And so the idea was um, to have it on an evening or the afternoon on June 20th and on a Thursday 
at the Eastern Prom, and you know, we really, it was a trick getting this through because I initially called uh, an individual, and then she gave me another individual who gave me an email, who then gave me a number, and then so two emails later and two phone calls later, I had finally reached the director of the public service for the city of Portland, in which we went through my presentation all over the phone, and um, he liked it for the most part, except for this slide, because he felt like it was not, um, it was too vague, and so. Jim had approached me and said, you know, like, if he said it was too vague, then it's too vague. And in this industry, you really, you have to go above and beyond. And so when I got off the phone with him, I went right up to the Eastern Prom with my camera. I took a picture. I went back, used, um, I used Photoshop, and I created this for uh, this proposal for the parking area. And currently, uh, my fingers are still crossed that it's going to get approved and that hopefully on June 20th I'll be seeing all of you on the Eastern Prom <laughs> eating fried food or eating great food on a great uh, hot summer evening or afternoon. And so to wrap it all up, there was a whole lot more to PR than I thought. There's so many different clients. You're always, if you're not doing something, then you're doing something wrong. There's always something going on in this business. Um, and I was in very much so surprised by the amount of research and preparation that goes into what these guys do. I mean, for, even for the, um, for the school lunches, I had to create my own presentation with pictures and whatever and, um, and then present it. And so you really, you can't wing it. Just like this presentation, I could not have winged this and so it really taught me that. Uh, note taking is extremely critical uh, in this business since there's so many different things going on. You have to have attention to detail and networking is obviously as essential with a PR firm. Um, and then big events do require a lot of help. I'm used to super fan events, maybe receiving help from Chelsea Wynott, our class president, or other students that are willing to help, but with uh, an event dealing with four or five popular trucks and then potentially thousands of people, or hopefully at least maybe hundreds, um, there's a lot that goes into it. And then on that same note, uh, the bureaucratic system can delay entrepreneurship and creativity. Uh, I'm currently in a group email, I guess you could say, with uh, nine or so staff of the city, of the town hall uh, for Portland, which include people from the business and licensing department, uh, public service department, and other department supervisors. And so, and it's been really tough because they always refer back to, you know, the ordinance governs or this and that, but it's tough. Like, you have to grind it out and convince what you, what's going to be best for the city. And so, once again, my fingers are still crossed. I'm hoping that's going to turn out for the best. And then, back to my central question, social media has really changed the world. I mean, in this generation, most, web, most businesses don't have websites. We're using Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn to find out uh, about what, this business, what businesses are saying about themselves and what um, other people are saying about them. And it's really, it's changing daily with new applications and new sites, Vine and Snapchat or whatever. And this whole idea of the golden 24 hour to respond to a bit, uh, an issue or a controversy has now become the golden hour since social media is changing so rapidly and you have such quick access. And also new sites like this one, Prezi, was new to me in which you can create a presentation, share it on Facebook, share it with the Prezi community, and then receive help um, via comments, via video, or maybe how to make a slide flow smoother, and I thought that was really interesting. And so, all in all, I'd say this was a very successful SDP. My SDP currently isn't over because uh, it's going to hopefully be over June 20th when this event falls through. Um, and once again, I really hope it works. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Jordan, Mrs. Kaplan, and then Mr. and Mrs. Britt for providing me with this incredible opportunity. And uh, thank you. So, this was just a sample. There were 120 others, and they were extraordinary. Um, I've got a great job. Um, it was my pleasure to shepherd some of these folks through this process. Um, I wish we had more time and we could have uh, more people here, but at least you got a sample of it. Thank you very much for, oh, Piper is here. Piper, would you come down and do uh, your presentation as well? All right, come on down.
the CETV audience is now competing with the Boston Bruins and Pittsburgh Penguins, so <laughs> our viewership may go down here, we'll see. So for my SDP, I worked for a textile company right here in Maine. They have two locations. They have a mill, which used to be in Hollowell, Maine, but they've grown so much that they had to expand to a whole warehouse facility in Monmouth, Maine. And then they have a retail store and their corporate offices in Freeport. Um, here my presentation is. And I was familiar with this company because my mom just sold, but she owned a retail furniture and home goods store in Falmouth, Maine, and we sold Brahms Mount Blankets since day one. We were always pretty impressed by the quality of them. Well, I'll just start. So the title of my presentation, as you can kind of see, is One Step Back and Two Step Forward. Um, Brahms Mount is going one step back because they're keeping with Maine's tradition. Um, ever since from the 1800s, Maine has a huge textile industry. There were dozens of mills all along the Kennebunk River. Um, families all spun um, yarns, and imported yarns, and they all did that sort of thing. But it's also going two step forward. Um, in 2009, the company was bought by a man who really saw the company for a whole new thing and really thought he could expand it. And since he jumped on board, it's probably, the business has probably quadrupled. Um, they've gotten into accounts like Bloomingdale's, Neiman Marcus, Serena and Lily, and they're now working on a project for Alex and Annie, which is those metal bracelets. Um, they're opening an apparel line. Um, and just probably since 2009, they've expanded their product line by over 75%. Before then, they were adding and dropping colors every season, maybe a new item, but now it's full launch of product. So here are some pictures. Um, this right here is the linen towels. A lot of people are pretty shocked by that they sell linen towels, but linen's actually one of the most absorbent fibers and it retains water much well, much better than a normal towel. These are bed blankets. So not only do they do throws and day blankets, but they do bed blankets for any size bed in cotton linen or cotton linen or merino wool. They work with all natural fibers. This in the center is their most popular item, which is a cotton herringbone throw. All these blankets are made on antique shuttle looms from 1930s. They have about eight of the looms in the factory. They break down every five minutes, but they'll, they'll work on those till they can. They think it just shows a whole other quality that nobody else can achieve. And that's that. So why Brahms Mount? Like I said, I used to display their product at my mom's store. I was familiar with it. I knew why people bought it, and I just loved it. We have it on every bed in my home, and it's really one of a kind. I'm passionate about design. Someday I do want to become a designer. And I do have a strong interest in textiles and how I can incorporate textiles into what I would like to study, which is accessory design at the Savannah College of Art and Design. And again, my love for the product. So on my second day of my STP, I drove up to Monmouth, Maine, and I worked in the factory. And I started at the first guy and ended up at the lady who was putting it in the plastic bag ready to ship it off and I condensed it to show how a blanket is made in 14 steps. 
So this first step is all the boxes of the raw material that comes from all around the world. And in these boxes are the second step, which are the cones, and that's what they call them. And those are either yarn, cotton, linen, wool, etc. And they're either dyed in a separate dye house, and those are dyed for six hours, or they're the natural color. And for the third step, all of these cones get lined up and they all get strung through at the top of that third, right there. Then they all get weaved through on the fourth through combs up there. Oh, sorry. And then they all on the fifth step get wrapped around that roll. And that's the base of the material and then the rest is all weaved in between. So the six, you can see this is the 1930s shutter loom in action. You can see it's blurry because it's moving incredibly fast. And in the seventh step, you can see that's actually a baby blanket being made. And the reason they're called shutter looms is because in the eighth step, you can see those are bobbins, and those are flying back and forth, creating the pattern, weaving in and out through that base of material. Um, so then that baby blanket just keeps getting wrapped over and will make a 100, 200 yard roll. And then that day, they'll look through the books, and they'll see what needs to be made, and they'll pull it out from the yardage in that ninth step you can see. Then they'll cut it, and they cut it by taking a pick, which is one of those bobbins that was flying across, make a straight line and cut through that. Then there's about four or five seamstress that are all day surging the ends to the product, and that's in the 11th step. And I don't know if I already said this, but every product is touched by 50 different hands. And in the 12th, everything is wash. And that's another cool thing about this company. A lot of people think because they're made on these looms and because they're an heirloom quality that they can't be washed. But everything this company does can be washed. 13th, you can see all the products stacking up and ready to go. And then in the 14th step, that's all the inventory. And one lady there is shipping out 40 to 50 boxes a day all around the world. Another part of my job was helping out in the retail store, which was something I was pretty familiar with because of my experience at my mom's store. Um, they have a retail store in the old Jameson's Tavern right next to L.L. Bean. Um, so these are some, I have two before and after shots of some of the work I did in it. So this is right when you first used to walk into the store. So you opened the door and you saw that first picture. And they went for a wedding theme display which looked really good, but I thought you should be able to walk into Brahms Mount and know exactly why you were walking in. Because a lot of people aren't familiar with this company. So I made instead stacks of blankets. And another great thing about the store is that they only sell Made in America products. That's their claim to fame, and that's their claim to fame with the blankets, that they're all made right here in Maine. Mm. So everything in the store is made in the U.S. and as much Maine as possible. So this first shelf is a lot of Simon Pierce which a lot of people know about. It's a glass company out of Vermont. It's really popular for wedding gifts. So, and then the second picture is just how I redisplayed it. I went out and got flowers and just made it, I think, a little bit cleaner. And another aspect was working with the designer. And this was obviously something that I really wanted to do because I felt that could give me the closest feel of what it would like to be a designer. So these top two pictures are design boards that I made so that when they're in meetings, they can quickly reference the blankets in the market right now. So that first one is all the blankets in season right now, and the second one is all the bed blankets. Um, the designer and I talked a lot about how she gets her inspiration, and every time it comes time for her to need new product, she actually goes through fashion magazines and sees the color trends, and that's how she picks up all of her colors. Um, we talked also a lot about which this really surprised me, is she's in charge of sourcing the material. So she finds a product and she finds what, she finds an idea for a product she wants to make, but then she has to think of what material would best suit it. So right now they're working on the apparel line, which is going to start with shawls. So she wanted to find the most lightweight, non-scratchy wool. So she spent months and months trying to source this wool. And I guess I just never thought about that aspect of the job, but that was a huge part of what she did more of what I learned. I learned that in a small business like Brahms Mount, they rely on people filling the roles of multiple people. There was probably about 50 employees, but it seemed like, and I worked with every single one of them, but it seemed like every person knew every single aspect of the company. They knew every single person in the company, they knew what they did, and they could know how to help them if they needed to. 
And there are quite a few employees, too, that have been there since day one. I learned also that it takes a lot of capital investment to come out with new products, all to see basically a gamble if the consumer likes it and if the consumer don't, doesn't. So with this, um, I keep referencing the shawls, but that was a huge capital investment to buy all the wool. And they're going to preview it next week at the Atlanta market just to see if customers like it. And that's pretty much the gamble, I think, with any product line. You're always putting out new product to see if they like it. And that brings me to the next one, the market tells all. So they're always relying on what the consumer wants to add, drop, or expand, and what colors to add or drop. They're probably every season, I'd say, dropping three and adding three more, especially with those herringbone blankets, because that was their most popular. And the last part is sales pitches are how they draw in their clients. Um, to get clients like the Neiman Marcus and the Nordstrom's and the Bloomingdale's, they travel to wherever their offices are, bring all the product, the owner comes, the designer comes, the past owners come, and they give hour-long pitches and really blow the people away. And that's how they rely on capturing the people, just telling about the history, the history of Maine, the history of these shutter looms, and the quality, and that you can't really achieve that anywhere else. And that's all. But it was definitely a really great experience. Okay. Thank you for it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, folks, um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. I hope you get an idea of the outstanding graduates that we have this year. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Go Bruins. Okay.